Cancer is a complex disease in terms of how it comes about, but then our bodies are complex. And it's amazing when you think of how our cells are replacing themselves every day. Hello and welcome to HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing. On today's episode, we're going to talk about reducing your risk of cancer. I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Trina McCarthy, who is a consultant in public health medicine for the National Cancer Control Programme. If you'd like to give us a rating on whatever platform you are listening to us on, please do so. Trina, when I was preparing for this podcast, I was looking at the figures and I have to say they really scared me. So I'm only going to mention one or two at the outset because I don't want to scare the listeners off straight away in relation to cancer. But cancer is the leading cause of death in Ireland and one in two people in Ireland will develop cancer in their lifetime. That's a big number. Yeah, it is. It is sobering, isn't it? When you think just how common cancer is and you need to balance that with there are things we can do about our cancer risk as well. And to remember what we can do, which is what we're talking about today, what we can do to reduce our risk. Even when you look at the past few years and look at the trends in Ireland, we can see how changes in lifestyle and changes in people's behaviours can have positive impacts. So, for example, we know that obviously the rates of smoking have been decreasing, maybe not so much just at the minute, but they have been coming back down over the past few decades. And it's now we're seeing that the rates of lung cancer in both men and women are decreasing. So things can turn around. So I think that's so we're seeing the benefits of all of the work that has gone on to try and prevent it. It's just coming to light now. Yeah, we can see it. It's a long game always. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> it is a long yeah. game. Why do people get cancer? Cancer is a complex disease in terms of how it comes about, but then our bodies are complex. And it's amazing when you think of how our cells are replacing themselves every day. It's mind blowing when you think of a cell being smart enough to literally, you know, clone itself and, re- and replace itself exactly to do what it was doing already. And All of our body is turning over the whole time, you know, even the bits that we don't think are growing. We might see our hair and our nails, but the other parts of our body, you know, our skin, our organs, cells are turning over and changing. And sometimes they make mistakes when they do that. There's things that kind of cause damage to our body and affect the DNA, which regulates how your cells turn over and can trigger things like that. And there's things that can affect how your body fixes the DNA when it goes wrong, we'll say. So if cells start to replicate out of control, so that's really what it is, just cells growing in an uncontrolled fashion. That's what gives you a tumour or a cancer. You know, it's just kind of running amok, whereas it's normal for cells to replace themselves. But if they grow in that kind of unregulated way, that's what gives you a cancer. So it can vary in terms of the types of causes, where the cancer occurs. You know, the specific cause can give you different types of cancer. But the basic thing is that cells replacing themselves, that mechanism has gone wrong somewhere, you know, and it's a complex mechanism. So there's a lots of places along that journey where it could have happened. Yeah. And we have a National Cancer Control Strategy. Trina, do you want to tell us a little bit about the National Cancer Control Programme? Sure. So we're on our third National Cancer Strategy in the country now. The first one really was about getting sort of basic cancer services off the ground and The second cancer strategy in 2006 then was the one that brought up the concept of cancer control for the first time and really thinking beyond just treating cancer and looking at the whole pathway a little bit more, you know, so considering how services are organized, but also Mm. getting into the services and out of the services and introducing the idea of prevention at one end or living with and, and beyond cancer at the other That's where the National Cancer Control Programme was set up at that stage to kind of take a lead in terms of implementing quite a lot of that in terms of organisation of services, trying to put them in a structured way, have specialised services, maybe centralised in certain ways or have pathways to make sure it was easier for GPs to know where to send patients and have those structures set up. Our current strategy is the 2017 to 2026 strategy that we're working on. We're not responsible for all of it, but for, for quite yeah. a lot of the implementation of it, there are obviously aspects of it that, you know, our other colleagues within HSC, including screening services and, and other wider HSC, are really key partners in or that are more kind of government policy things that the Department of Health takes the lead on. And in this current one, again, I think both ends of the patient pathway, they prevention message I think was much stronger 
in this strategy, as well as the survivorship quality of life aspects. There are two things that were really emphasized much more in the strategy and which kind of led to a more focused emphasis on reducing your risk of cancer. What can we do within the NCCP to support others to do that? And mm. I think internationally, it's been said many times that we can't treat our way out of the cancer problem. You know, we have yes. so many types of cancer. We have lots of exciting novel treatments coming on board. But when we look at advances being made, aging populations, age is the biggest risk factor for almost all cancers. And with our growing populations and aging populations, you're just going to see the actual numbers continue to rise. Because people are living longer. So there's a lot of people out there who are living with cancer or survivors of cancer. Survivors of cancer as well. Yeah. Yeah. But even just in terms of the actual numbers of people developing cancer, that will increase with a larger population, but also with your age as being a risk factor. So, you know, that really to treat our way out of that prevention is better than cure, obviously. But what can we do so people know how to reduce their risk in the first place and create environments as well and policies that support that happening? Again, preparing for this, I realized that there was 12 modifiable ways to reduce your risk of cancer. And some of them we know already. And people know, not realizing that they're modifiable and even the word modifiable to me, I thought was a little bit confusing for the general public. But of course, we know tobacco. And like you said earlier on, we can see the benefits of people reducing tobacco. But there's lots of other ones. And sometimes I wonder, do people really know that alcohol can cause seven types of cancer? Mm -hmm. Part of our role, we would see it is to increase awareness of the different risk factors. And we'd call them the 12 steps to reduce your cancer risk. So that's much better than modifiable modifiable risks. (laughs) So a mouthful of modifiable. And I suppose when you say modifiable, it's things you can do something about. That's really what it is. And in particular, things that you might have individual control. But again, recognizing that a lot of what we need to make happen might be just to make that choice the easier choice or to support public policies that will drive that. So the alcohol example is an important one because certainly that was something we did a lot of research on in terms of, well, first of all, the people's awareness was quite low, but also those seven types of cancer that are associated. I mean, the fact that alcohol will affect basically, if you think of your whole digestive tract, I mean, most of the organs along there in terms of your gut and your stomach, the risk is increased there. That makes sense. So as it's going down to your yes. body, it can yeah. affect all of your the lining. Yeah. yeah. And what's particularly interesting is, I mean, and that's starting up even kind of head and neck areas. Mm. So your mouth and your throat and gullet. What's interesting as well is that alcohol is a very good solvent. And if you're a smoker and drink alcohol, that it actually helps the cancer causing substances in your okay. cigarette be absorbed yeah. better. So we call it a synergistic effect, you know, where the two risk factors actually multiply instead of just add together. So for things like head and neck cancer, smoking and alcohol are, you know, a real bad combination, you know, so the alcohol can help those things be absorbed into your body, which doesn't help. It can also trigger sort of DNA damage on further down when it's metabolized. So it's not just in the line of your gut. And it all seems to have a hormonal effect. So that's why things like breast cancer, that there is an increased risk as well. And I suppose that's why we're going to get the labeling changed in Ireland. That's coming in soon, isn't it? Yeah, so that we will yeah. ident- we will explain to people just like it was on a cigarette box that alcohol does cause cancer. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a good awareness campaign, Yeah, you know. That's an important one that we lobbied for, but I suppose it's also one that was in the context of all of the other public health alcohol bill measures, such Mm. as looking at pricing and controlling promotions. Those measures, I think, in terms of managing our drinking overall in society, they were important things, too. So we're doing it in terms of having the evidence there and showing why that will impact our our rate to cancer is important. The other ones that we have and we in Health and Wellbeing have got some campaigns to try and encourage people to make the healthy choice, make good lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. So like physical activity, healthy eating. I know that we in the HSE, we have a breastfeeding campaign. And then, of course, you've got your cancer screening. I'm sure that you work closely with the The cancer screening service. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All those ones you mentioned in terms of both the dietary risks, but also obesity and being a risk factor kind of from maybe an inflammatory point of view and a hormonal point of view, increasing your risk of quite a number of cancers, but physical activity being protective. They're all really important in terms of screening. It is one of our 12 steps to reduce your risk of cancer. And I think people often think of screening and think of screening being there just to find cancer early, which it can do. But 
it's also important in terms of finding something that might turn into a cancer and treating that yes. before it happens. So it, it is a means of catching something before it even turns into cancer. So you're talking about, say, removing polyps. You know, if you have your bowel screening done, this, these little polyps haven't become cancerous yet, but they're at risk of turning into a cancer. And having those removed is really preventing a cancer. And similarly, in your cervical screening, you know, one of the main purposes of that is to, to detect changes in the cervix that likely are possible to develop into cancer and treating those. So screening is actually a form of prevention as well. So that's another means of reducing your risk in terms of taking part in the recommended screening programs. Yeah, absolutely. And it's good opportunity just to say to our listeners that if they do get the opportunity to attend any of the screening programs to please do so and don't just throw the notification in a drawer and forget about it that it's so important to keep those appointments up yeah I think the service works really well I think I got my breast screening about a week after I was 50 Mm -hmm. just sharing my age now (laughs) but um Obviously, I didn't get any older than 50. I'm still only 50. (laughs) But I couldn't believe that I got it so fast. And I was really delighted and honoured to go and think, oh, my God, this is amazing. Because as a mother, it was making me think about myself for just those few minutes. Yeah. Because I would never think of going to have a mammogram or anything. So Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really good reminder from them, you know. We've other preventable factors, but first of all, I wanted to ask you about the National Cancer Control Programme. And I know that you work with a lot of other agencies and other voluntary organisations, because one organisation can't do everything. I know there's lots of parts of the HSE that do look at trying to reduce the risk of cancer, but there is a lot of people that you guys work with. Absolutely. We're lucky in Ireland to have some really good cancer charities and advocacy groups. And quite early on, we approach them about having a common voice and a common sense of what the evidence is, is there around cancer risk and what measures people should take. So in that, we established the Irish Cancer Prevention Network. So that would have ourselves from the National Cancer Control Programme and our other colleagues in the HSC in the National Screening Service working with the charities, which would be the Irish Cancer Society, Breakthrough Cancer Research and the Mary Keating Foundation, and then also the Irish Skin Foundation from the perspective of skin cancer risk. That's been just a really fruitful collaboration, whether it's around awareness days, whether it's the development of resources such as we have resources on the 12 steps to reduce your cancer risk or other similar resources so that we all input into them. So it's like, again, back to the whole trusted source of information. Exactly. Maybe the HSE is trying to do. So if you gather all the information from all these people, then they're the real experts. Exactly. You can trust that because it's such a group of experts. Yeah. And it's it's just to have that consistent message as well, because sometimes, you know, there'll be 25 percent in one study and 30 percent in another. And you just don't want to confuse things. So just being very clear as to what the risk is and what you should do and how to communicate that, I think, has been very helpful. And a lot of those resources we've collaborated on have been things such as method materials, such as around the 12 steps, which people want to use those and, and you know, working with community groups or anything like that. You can get those on the healthpromotion.ie website and order them from there. Yeah. So any of our listeners could get that from some of those yeah, resources. So you can order, yeah, you can order resources from there in terms of, you know, if you want actual hard copies of resources or download Very good. PDFs of them as well. So it's so healthpromotion.ie. Yeah. And you mentioned skin cancer. I know it's coming to the end of the summer. Didn't get an awful lot of sunshine in Ireland, Mm. but it's not really about that in Ireland, really. It's not really about the sunshine. It's the UV rays and can be quite confusing, really, for people. Yeah, I mean, it's the UV radiation that hits our skin. That's the number one risk factor for skin cancer. And it's that radiation coupled with how vulnerable your skin is. Even if it's not sunny outside, there's still UV rays, is it? So there's UV rays if there's daylight. It's just the strength then of that UV radiation and the type of UV rays that are hitting your skin. So there's UV radiation all year round, really. And it's the UVA and UVB can damage your skin. The UVB is particularly concerning, I suppose, in terms of sunburn and then risk of melanoma. And that tends to be a little bit more seasonal. So that's the one where it's for an April to September issue. Obviously, people know that they don't get burnt in Ireland in in December. So that's, that's why. So that type of radiation is higher from April to September. So Trina, what action can we take to reduce the risks of skin cancer in Ireland at the moment? So the best things for people to follow would be to follow the Healthy Ireland SunSmart 5 S's. So we have slip, slop, slap, seek and slide. So slip is to slip on long sleeved clothing with collars on your shirt, we'll say, to 
reduce the amount of sunlight hitting your skin. Slop on your sunscreen. So that would be using a factor 30 plus for an adult or 50 plus for a child. Then to slap on a hat, so preferably a wide brimmed hat so that you protect your ears and your neck. To seek shade, so again, particularly in the middle part of the day between 11 and 3 to get out of direct sunlight or say if you have a a young child in a buggy to make sure you use a shade on the buggy, that's quite important as well. And then to slide on sunglasses, because again, we think about our skin, but also at the back of our eyes, you can actually get melanoma cancers at the back of your eyes from radiation as well. So sunglasses will protect that. And the best ones to use are wraparound sunglasses because it stops the rays from coming in around the side as well. And other than the five S's, just remember never to use a sunbed. Don't deliberately try and get a suntan either. There's no real such thing as a healthy suntan. Just love the skin you're in, as I say. What about the usage of sunbeds? Is there still a lot of It's kind cancers? of a persistent proportion yeah. of people that use sunbeds. And there's the fact that, you know, you can hire sunbeds, you know, yourself mm. as well. So that's a little bit harder to monitor. So it's, I mean, obviously we'd probably prefer if they didn't exist at all, but, you know, we do have our sunbed legislation and, you know, the public health legislation, the Sunbeds Act, which would at least, you know, say that people under 18 shouldn't be using them and that people who do use sunbeds need to be told the risks of using them. Mm. The main thing is to emphasize to people that is UV radiation as if you're sort of in a tropical sun setting, that's what you're exposing your, your skin to. And, you know, yeah. we say that if you start using sunbeds at a younger age, you know, you're yeah. really um, increasing your risk of, of melanoma, which mm. I didn't mention already, but would be the more serious form yes. of skin cancer. Is skin cancer the biggest type of cancer in Ireland? Yeah. So if you count all the skin cancers in together, we have what we'd call the non-melanoma types. So what's non-melanoma? So the melanoma type, I suppose if I mentioned that one first, is still quite common. I mean, it's, it's mm. the fourth commonest in men and women. And that's the type where it's, I mean, it looks like a mole or a, you know, a bit of pigmented colored lesion in your skin. And that's the risky one. So about a thousand people a year, you know, it's just still significant numbers of people. And it can happen in people quite young compared to okay. some other cancers. You know, it's not unusual and people in their, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s can get melanoma, whereas a lot of other cancers, you're talking a little older age group. But melanoma can spread to the rest of your body. So that's why that's a particular concern, because obviously it's spreading to your other organs. And if treatment doesn't work, then that's obviously some people die from melanoma. Whereas mm. the other types of skin cancers are really common. And, you know, it's at 10,000 plus and growing numbers. And some people get multiple ones, but we would just group them together. There's a few different types. Yeah, so we'd kind of group them together as non-melanoma because they're the kind of the other types that tend not to spread. Now, some of them can go to your glands and that, Yeah, you know, you might need some radiation therapy or you need surgery. So you still want to avoid getting them. And again, they're associated with the UV radiation from the sun, particularly kind of chronic exposure, you know, so mm. as in over years or kind of year so around. So people working outside, farmers. Absolutely be higher yeah. risk. Yeah. You know, the things on your ears, you know, guess, you know, if you haven't covered yeah. your ears or your neck, you know, those areas that are. So this is a big challenge for us if it's the number one cancer. And obviously your campaign has started uh, quite a few years ago, but it's gathering momentum because we're seeing it and hearing it. So I suppose what we're hoping that in a few years time, we'll see a reduction just like we did with the whole tobacco Smoking rates and that. Like yeah. that's the one that we're all aiming for, really, isn't it? That we'll Absolutely, see the reductions yeah. in this and it'll, that'll be measured quite easily in a way because people won't be showing up with those cancers, hopefully. Yeah. yeah Has that I been proven in any other countries with these big campaigns? Yeah. So Australia, uh, you know, would be the country we'd look to most oh, really in terms good. of skin cancer because they would have just given historical reasons. A lot of people with similar yeah. complexion to Caucasian people living in Ireland and they would have had you know the highest rates by far and would have supported us in terms of allowing us to adopt the slip, slop, slap. And slide, so what are know, their so numbers? What are their trends? So like they're, now? they've seen the trends kind of turn now which is great to actually see they you know that Mm. growing incidence see that turn so they've demonstrated that which is good they probably had a head start I think here we have the added challenge because we do have the cloudy days and the rain and to convince people there's still UV rays even if it's a bit cloudy daylight yeah you have UV rays. So that's a message, I suppose, for our listeners as well, you know, to try and help reduce your risks, you know. Yeah. And our weather is just so changeable. That's the other thing. You yeah. Know? So, I mean, yeah, clouds can filter out some of the UV. But the problem is that, you know, you go out in the morning and it's raining mm. and then the sun is beating down on you, <laughs> you know, know, two hours later and you, yeah. you have no sunscreen on and you've, you know, so it's that. I think that's another thing in Ireland that we have just to Just get into for. good habits, I suppose, yeah. from an early age. 
So what would be the types of sunscreens that they should use to try and help reduce the risks of skin cancer? If it's a child, we'd recommend using a factor 50 for an adult, making sure it's factor 30. And then in terms of having broad spectrum covers so that it's protecting against UVA and UVB, you can either see a star rating or a UVA in a circle. That's the European standard. So if you look for those certified marks on it in mm. terms of five star UVA in a circle, to be honest, one of the biggest things is people remembering to reapply it, you know, as well. That's the other thing. So if it is a time of the year when the UV rays are at their highest and particularly the time of day, you know, to make sure that if you're swimming or if you're exercising and sweating and that, that you reapply it and really you should re- reapply it every two hours anyway. OK, and I know you have a lot of information in relation to your Sun Smart campaign and people can get that information as well. Where's the best place for them to go so to? So the shortcut for that would be hse.ie forward slash sunsmart. So okay. there'd be a lot of resources there around working with children's groups and schools or for parents, families, for outdoor workers, you know, Perfect. recreational groups. We'd have yeah. a lot of that there. Yeah, that's really good because I think the more we can promote that, the better for everybody, really. And then we have other ways that we can reduce our risks of cancer. Things like radon. And I'm just not sure how we as individuals can impact on that or our workplaces. Those were things when I looked at them, I thought, oh, Jeannie, I didn't even know. Or what can we do ourselves even? Like radon is sort of a natural form of radiation. The thing is, it depends on the stone your building is built on and what your building is made of as to whether radon can gas. Can you test for that before yeah. you build? There's radon maps that you can look at, we'll say, in terms of where they are. But sometimes it's to do with the actual building as well. So it's, as things are built, they can be tested. But probably the biggest impact is the changes as a national radon strategy and the change in the building regulations to make sure that at least new buildings as they're built that radon protective measures are put in there so that there's either barriers or means of ventilating the radon out if it's required. So that will be done automatically, will it? So that's in terms of new bills, I suppose that's being put in now. Now people can still go to, you know, radon.ie to check in terms of, you know, how to test your own building then. And a little similar to what I mentioned about alcohol and smoking, again, radon and smoking don't work well together. So it's a risk factor for lung cancer. But one of the biggest things is if you're a smoker, and you're exposed to radon in a building, those things, again, have a multiplying effect. There's things I'd never think of putting together. They're like the tricky ones, aren't they? So smoking cessation is even more important or avoiding smoking altogether for people who live in a radon area. Yeah. And then in your workplace... Yeah, so there's legislation around, you know, exposure to radiation in the workplace, for example, in the health services, you know, making sure that's controlled or with different substances. So there's legislative measures around those to make sure that you're protected. But then there's also simple things like whether you work outdoors as part of your job as well. So again, making sure your skin is protected. So there are things to do with your work environment. You can take that responsibility, I suppose, yourself as well, that if you Mm -hmm. are working outdoors, if it's your place of work, then you could talk to your employer, I guess, to say, do you have sunscreen we've, available for us? We've actually had done quite a lot of work with a number of employers some of the big employers around having their health and safety officers working on, on this area and having information for the employees, having sunscreen dispensers available. Yes, and yes actually been really positive. So. That's really, really good. One of the other things that I was wondering about is, as well, I know that we say 40 percent of cancers are preventable. But there's still 60% that isn't. And that's like, oh God, you know. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we'd say, you know, 30 to 50% are, you know, in some way preventable and there's others that aren't. And there are things that either maybe we don't understand, yes, or okay. there's things about our age, you know, just your age and your genetics. It's not going to be avoidable. People that make good lifestyle choices and, you know, they're fit and they're healthy and they have a good diet and they don't smoke and they don't really drink. And then they still get cancer. And there's that sense of guilt of like, what have I done? I'm trying my best and I can still get it if it's maybe genetic. And I hate the thought that somebody who's gone through a cancer journey would then be feeling guilty that they've done this to themselves or something. Absolutely not. What you're doing is trying to make lifestyle choices to sort of stack the odds in your favor, you know, but unfortunately it is just so common. And the fact that the human cells are complex and what they Mm. need to do in terms of replicating that cancers do occur, you know, even if you do everything right, that's not a reason not to take the steps you can. Of course, yeah. And the fact that all of those measures that you take in general to reduce your risk of cancer will also reduce your risk of heart disease, you know, severe lung disease, your risk of diabetes, you know, so it'll have other benefits beyond your risk of cancer. But I think you're right. You know, if you do everything right, 
Absolutely. You know, you just sometimes you just can't avoid what life has in store for you. But I think the main thing is for people to be alert to the possible signs and symptoms of cancer and go to your GP if you have any concern and make sure that you act on those worries and get checked out because detecting cancer at an earlier stage, you know, that's another area that we're working on that we can discuss another day. But, you know, what you can do to get your cancer picked up as early as possible. It's not all a negative message then in terms of, you know, we see that our number of survivors with cancer is growing and that's because the overall survival is improving year Mm. on year so for the first time we've over 200,000 people living in Ireland who have a cancer diagnosis and are living a good life afterwards so cancer is probably was felt to be sort of a a, such a death sentence back decades ago but now treatments and that have all moved on so if a cancer diagnosis occurs you know in yourself or in your family just to remember it Times have changed. There are so many treatment options. There are so many supports available. Trina, I think that's a really good note to maybe finish up this podcast on because we're finishing on the positive note. (laughs) And then when we think of cancer, there's so many negative, but it is amazing to think about the amount of people that have survived. And because people are living longer Mm -hmm. and they can live and they can live very healthily and very fulfilling lives. So Trina, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today and giving us so much information and things to think about how to reduce our cancer risk. Now, I know that you have some places you'd like to signpost people to because we do have a lot of information. So would you like to just call out those couple of different areas that might be of benefit to people? Sure. Yeah. Just to mention the 12 steps to reduce your cancer risk, we have e-learning modules covering those just short kind of 10 to 15 minute modules in which people might be interested in looking at and they're on hseland.ie. And then also just for the general information on the National Cancer Control Programme and on cancer prevention, you can go to hse.ie forward slash cancer or to the prevention section, hse.ie forward slash cancer prevention. And you can also sign up for the Irish Cancer Prevention Network newsletter. We have over a thousand subscribers at this stage. So we send that out quarterly as well and would have a lot of interesting information there for people. That's great. Thank you very much, Trina. And just to our listeners, just to say that we really appreciate your support for our HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. If you think that this podcast or any of the other podcasts in our series would be of benefit to friends, family or work colleagues, please share them with them. And we hope that you'll come back and listen to us next week on our next episode. Thank you for listening.